Awesome. Well, thank you so much for um, help, helping us celebrate the launch of that premiere. We're really excited to have that um, video out in the world now, just like all the flowers that you guys are, are growing. So at this time, I would like to take a, um, a few minutes to introduce in each of our panelists. And they're going to take a, a couple of minutes and tell us about their farms and what they do. So the first farmer panelist is going to be Christina. Hi everyone, um, I'm Christina Natale of Little Hen Farm in North Haven, Connecticut. Um, we were established in July of 2019 when we purchased our property. Uh, we basically started from scratch that year. We bought a previous homestead of four and a half acres um, mixed use. It's partly wooded um, and we kind of are building out every year, increasing our growing space. Um, and last year we grew on about three quarters of an acre. So pretty small amount, but definitely enough for us to start with. Um, I have two part-time employees. Uh, the first year I started with one full-time employee and I think last year learned that two part-time is definitely better for us. Um, there's less burnout, one can cover if the other one's not there and you kind of identify what strengths and weaknesses people have and can work towards those. Um, my farming season starts basically now in February with starting seeds, starting soaking my anemone and ranunculus corms. Um, I do everything field grown, so I don't have any structures or hoop houses to start early. Um, I start all my seeds in a tiny little room in my house with shelving and shop lights um, and soil blocking. If you haven't soil blocked, definitely look into it. You can grow a large amount of plants in a small space. Um, and then we start planting out in March. Um, I usually buy in plugs for a lot of my early spring flowers um, because I like to take January off. Um, and then April, our first flowers bloom with tulips, and daffodils. Um, May and June, we start getting very busy. July, um, we generally slow down a little bit in the summer. August is a slower month. People are on vacation, um, it's really hot, so we don't like to work as much either. Um, and then we finish the season strong in September and October with fall weddings. Um, and then November is a big cleanup month for us. We dig a lot of our dahlias, plant our tulips, um, and basically put the farm to bed uh, and hopefully are done by the first week in December, which was the case last year. Um, and then I take December and January off. Um, I rest. It's kind of necessary for my mental health. Um, and uh, I do a little bit of planning and seed ordering during that time. Um, during the season, I mostly work full time. Um, and my, I ha my husband has an off farm, completely off farm job for supplemental income. So he doesn't work on the farm at all. It's just me and my two employees. Um, our business model has evolved over the last couple of years. Um, much like Haley was saying, she started with just growing everything and we kind of did as well. Um, we also kind of did everything in terms of our marketing and selling. Um, and just to see what stuck, I think the only thing we didn't do was farmer's markets. Um, but we did a subscription service. Um, we sold wholesale to the collective, luckily. Um, our first year was their first year, so we've kind of grown up with the collective a little bit, and it's become a big part of our business. Um, and the first year, I even got into a local shop in New Haven, which is the next town over. Um, I did DIY buckets, um, special orders. I even did a couple full-service weddings, which we have since cut from our business model. Um, and I even did a small vegetable CSA. Um, the next year we got rid of the vegetable CSA, um, just growing vegetables for ourselves and our employees and increased the collective sales. I increased my shops to five local shops in New Haven. Um, 
and I cut my subscription services down by several weeks. Um, and this year I'm specializing even more, cutting out subscriptions altogether, um, realizing that the cost benefit is, doesn't work for our farm. Um, it's a lot of labor and hopefully increasing our wholesale uh, outlets and sales at the collective with more days a week. Um, and growing, we're, we're learning what we're growing well and growing more of it and cutting out the things that we don't grow as well or other people grow a lot of um, and we can always supplement from them if we need to. Um, I think we, our farm differs from other farms because we do um, have chunks of time when we grow more uh, product than at other times. We focus highly on spring with hardy annuals that we plant in the fall. Um, I think this, when we first started, especially the collective, not a lot of people are doing this, um, but I think it is increasing um, every year. People are learning they can overwinter a lot more than they previously maybe thought they could in our region. Um, and every year it is getting warmer. Um, so more things are surviving, although this winter it kind of didn't work out like that, but um, every year is different in farming, like Haley said before. Um, and yeah, our mission statement is basically just to provide our community mm -hmm. and state with beautiful, unusual flowers that are grown in an environmentally conscious way. That's a little hint <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Christina. That was great. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Robert from EcoFarm. Morning, everyone. My name is Robert, and I, um, I operate EcoFarm in Woodstock, Connecticut. We are a certified organic um, vegetable and cut flower farm. Um, Echo Farm was established in around 1800 um, on land that was part of the um, Mata, uh, Wabaquaset band of the Nipmuc Nation. Um, it was a 100 acre uh, dairy farm for a couple of centuries, um, encompassing what you see on the map, all of A, B, and C. Um, by the time I bought the farm in 2015, all that was left was the 14 plus acres that represents that you see in um, marked as area C. And I'm growing on the field that's just to the left of the letter C. Um, we have now about two acres in, in production um, for both vegetables and cut flowers. Um, we sell primarily at a couple of local uh, farmers markets. So this is what um, our booth looks like um, in the fall with a mix of flowers and, and vegetables. Um, you'll see a lot of uh, dahlias and the last of our gladiolus peeking out of the back and, and some straw flowers. Um, we also sell at a farm stand um, at the farm, which as you can see is really just a tent with some tables and, um, and our product underneath it in a pretty shady area um, on the farm. So definitely nothing fancy, but hopefully this will be the last year that our farm stand looks like this. We're actually in the process of um, building a building so we can have this stuff indoors. Um, we grow, in terms of cut flowers, we grow mostly what I would call thrillers and not fillers. So um, we specialize in, in some of the basics um, like sunflowers, um, dahlias, as you saw before, um, gladiolus, zinnias, um, basically the, the plants that are um, really easy for us to kind of harvest and, and market well. Um, we really like, I like growing these um, double sunflowers. Um, this is lemonade, but I also grow a lot of goldie double. Um, as you can see, even puts a smile on the face of some of your grouchiest um, farmers. Um, I'm also really partial to, to dahlias. So um, you'll see on the right, um, we grow um, buckets of Cornell, which probably everybody knows and grows. Um, but we also um, on farm have a soft spot for uh, heirloom varieties. And on the left is Gary Huck which was um, developed in 1942 in Nazi-occupied Holland. Great, great, um, beautiful pink dahlia. Um, we also did a lot of gladiolus. I, I really liked them as a cut flower. Um, unfortunately, like I, 
I am probably not going to be able to grow them again um, because of thrips. Um, so anybody who's starting out, if you don't already have thrips um, on your farm, gladiolus is a really great flower to start with. Um, and uh, we, we, sold, we sold a lot of them. Um, on the right, you can see a picture of what our um, van looks like when we're going to market. I swear there are vegetables in there packed in the back. I, I do vegetables in a different, um, in addition to cut flowers. Um, and so just, just really quickly, um, we, I work full-time off farm um, and try to put in as many waking hours um, as I can um, on my farm. And you can see from those pictures, the flowers are not perfect. Um, so it's very much, um, very much a, a struggle, but because of the limitation on time that has a really big impact on what I grow and what I market and how I market it. Um, so again, we focus primarily on our farm stand, um, farmer's markets um, on the weekends. Um, the flowers that I grow primarily are things that we can harvest quickly um, they look nice. They're appealing to, um, they make our, our farm stand and our booth at the market look great um, in a way that a stack of lettuce and eggplant and cucumbers never will. Um, I've never had any customer walk by or walk into our, into our farm stand or into our booth and complain about, um, complain about our flowers, um, even when um, they're not perfect. Um, so that's, that definitely helps. And I think it certainly helps us sell our vegetables a little bit. Um, and even though I'm primarily a vegetable grower, um, I want to say that probably we're about maybe 50-50 in terms of our revenue, flowers and vegetables. Um, with some customers, it's, I think it's way easier to convince people to spend money on, on some nice looking flowers than it is to get them to eat broccoli. Don't know why. Um, but that's that's what I found. Um, aside from me working as many hours as I can on farm, uh, my partner works, um, will be working full-time on farm, and then we have a couple of other part-time people during the summer, uh, mostly local students. <coughs> Our market season runs from June to October, but I think as Haley and Christina mentioned, like there really isn't an off-season much anymore in farming. Pretty much there's work related to the farm all year round, even when I'm not growing and crop planning and record keeping and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> in terms of, um, in terms of, again, in terms of our mission, um, I mean, we try to, we're trying to grow the best quality, um, you know, uh, organic vegetables and cut flowers that we can. Um, and obviously that changes every year, as, as you heard from, from Haley and Christina, you know, we're, we are also running ourselves around trying to put out fires and figuring out what we're, what we do best, what we're not going to do again next year, because we don't do it very well. Um, so that is, um, so we're constantly pivoting and shifting. Um, and for me, I guess my career as a flower farmer was, um, again, starting out mostly with vegetables and um, slowly growing more and more flowers. Um, so I didn't start out grow trying to grow everything in cut flowers. Um, we're, we're just every year sort of adding on a couple of new things here and there uh, as we can manage it. Um, and that seems to be working all right for us. Um, and it, uh, as I said before, I think we have a, um, you know, we, we try to grow things that are unusual, try to grow things that are different. Um, at the farmer's market that I attend, um, there are several other vegetable growers who are at the market um, and not many other people who are growing flowers at all. Sometimes we may be the only flower vendor there. So the flowers definitely helps us um, stand out with customers who come to the market um, and at our farm stand, um, especially in a, in a community like Woodstock. Um, there are lots of farms here, primarily dairy farms, but there are other vegetable and flower farmers here. Um, and I think, uh, you know, what we grow in terms of our sunflowers and our dahlias and, and our glabs, um, they can help us to, to stand out in the marketplace and, and, and build up some customers. So I think that's all that I'd like to share right now. Um, thanks to everybody for, uh, for this great workshop. 
Robert, thank you so much. That was really great and um, so made some super poignant um, key, key noted things there that a lot of people will easily want to spend their money on flowers versus broccoli <laughs> or something else. So at this time, I want to introduce Kristen, who's with us from Muddy Feet. <laughs> Hi, I'm Kristen Borello from Muddy Feet Flower Farm. Um, just a little bit about, about sort of my history and my background. Um, I spent 20 years as a theater artist and producing director of a theater company in Chicago, Illinois. And um, there I was responsible for really everything um, in our productions from um, you know, organizing the artistic vision to making production schedules to, um, you know, loading, loading and driving trucks and uh, corresponding with clients. We did a lot of um, spectacle work for the city of Chicago, uh, performing all over the place in the public parks and the big institutional, um, you know, buildings and stuff. And so, you know, it was fantastic. And of course I had to be in all the shows too, cause I was an actor. Um, so it was really um, a very crazy life and um, wouldn't have traded it for the world. Um, but then I started a family and um, that led me to leaving the theater world and becoming a full-time mom. And during that time I started, uh, I started uh, taking classes in landscape design and doing um, garden design for clients around the city. And um, it's funny because I remember when I was at the theater, we did strategic planning. And when I was asked where I saw myself in 10 years, I said without hesitation on a flower farm with a pond. And um, flash forward, <laughs> here I am in Connecticut with my flower farm that has a pond. Um, but back in Chicago, I enrolled in a, um, a business training class for farmers at the Angelic Organics um, Learning Center. And what that was, was um, a two-year program where we focused on exactly that, writing a business plan for a future farm business. And so when I graduated from that program, I had a full 10-year business plan for starting um, my farm, which... Um, included moving my family <laughs> to the Northeast as opposed to uh, starting farming in the Midwest. Um, so we moved here in 2010. We bought an, um, an old colonial house built in 1776 on the original farm um, land here in Ashford, um, Connecticut. And, you know, we started farming and we jokingly call it our vertical learning curve because my husband was a writer. I was an actor and a theater producer and <laughs> we knew nothing about farming. I had been a gardener my entire life. I would um, la landscape all the apartment buildings I lived in because I had to have flowers. Um, so I recently went back to Chicago and saw um, the lilac shrubs I put in in a 300 <laughs> unit apartment building. Um, but anyway, so we, we started farming our land. We learned a lot. And one thing I put into my business plan was uh, three years of just building infrastructure, uh, learning, and not putting the pressure on myself to make money. Um, and so that was really um, a good thing to do because we were able to just um, kind of experiment, learn what we were doing, um, and also find um, the find the right market uh, for me and the, the flowers that I was growing. And so um, then, you know, after three years, it was like, okay, now it's time to earn our money back and start to make a living doing this. I work full time um, on the farm um, and my husband, I wouldn't have a single flower if it weren't for him. He is my farm manager, um, but he also works full time off, off, um, off the farm. He's a, a professor at uh, Central Connecticut State University. And um, uh, we also have three boys. Uh, part of the, my, one of my main primary goals for starting this business um, and moving the family um, 
to a farm environment was to get the boy, you know, to put the boys in a natural surrounding for their, uh, for growing up. Um, everybody knows electronics have um, created a huge impact on all of our lives. And those of us with children know especially how it's revolutionized childhood. So it was very important for my husband and me to sort of surround our kids with nature and so that they would learn, you know, obviously live in a beautiful place, but also, um, you know, just learn how to grow things, how to, um, you know, appreciate nature, also to see me start a business uh, that hopefully would be successful, uh, that they would have to participate in. And so, um, so here we are 10 years later. Um, I have worked the last, you know, the, the, for the first seven years of the farm was um, doing farmers markets primarily and retail. Um, and three years in, my husband sort of pushed me off the ledge and said, you need to do weddings. And uh, so he actually booked my first client and I was a nervous wreck, but it, you know, it went fine. Uh, and what I've learned um, over the last seven years is that, you know, with my background, aforementioned background in theater and production, it uh, made, it gave me all the skills I need to run a successful um, wedding floral uh, business in that, you know, with client communication, production, the Tetris of loading a vehicle with, you know, with centerpieces and bouquets and uh, arbors and all this stuff. Um, and so, and then also just all the client communication of dealing with brides and mothers of brides and venues and other vendors. Um, and so that was a really, uh, has been a really wonderful dovetailing of uh, my previous experience and then with with my uh, work that I do now. And so um, just this past year, well, so I mentioned my 10 year business plan. We are now 10 years in and um, I am transitioning now to my next 10 years. Um, in which case at the end of that, my husband and I will be in our mid 60s. Uh, it is not to be underestimated the physical toll that farming um, does to your body and to your mental health sometimes. It it's, can be pretty grueling work. Um, so in that regard, you know, we sort of are looking at the, the, the picture of the business and um, weddings have now become my primary source of income. So I decided last year that I was going to rebrand um, my wedding business um, away from Muddy Feet Flower Farm, because let's face it, that's not, that doesn't conjure these, you know, the Ill images of elegance and refinement <laughs> necessarily. Um, a charming name for a farm, sure, but for, um, you know, for brides and higher end weddings, um, I developed um, a, a separate brand, which is Farm Couture Flowers. And um, I'm spending more time um, moving my business uh, into, that, uh, into that realm. And to that regard, we just this past fall, uh, well, we joke we, that we are seniorizing our farm as we you know, move towards um, more retirement age. Uh, our boys will be grown and gone at that point. And, um, and so we're gonna concentrate on doing less annual uh, flower production and invest more in perennials. Uh, we just took, took three annual beds and half of my dahlia field and planted those in peonies um, in the fall. And, um, and so, and then my annual crop planning that we're doing um, for this season is starting to just to, to grow less of, you know, the summer annuals that, um, you know, all your growers at farmers markets and whatnot are growing like the zinnias and the sunflowers and this and concentrate more on higher end flowers that um, floral designers want and that I need for my wedding business. Um, and so that's, that's kind of, where where we're at um, with Muddy Feet and now Farm Couture. Uh, Muddy Feet will continue on um, selling to, uh, wholesale mostly uh, at, through the collective um, and then also um, I'm a vendor at the Westport Farmers Market and, um, and there's a new venture in West Hartford that's starting up this year that I'll be helping out and participating in as well. So, um, so that's just kind of in a, in a nutshell what Muddy Feet is all about. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kristen. I really appreciate that. And there's there's so much that goes into the story and, and your journey and entrepreneurship. So thank you for sharing that. 
So right now we're going to get into some questions that um, I'm going to ask each of the panelists to answer, um, you know, in a nice, short, sweet way so that we can get up to a few of the questions. And like I, we said earlier, if you have questions, please um, pose them in the chat and Becca can feed those to the panelists as well. So um, we're going to get into um, the first question that we have. So are there any auxiliary auxiliary businesses that are needed for your work and your your business to thrive? So we're going to start with Haley. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, so by auxiliary businesses, I'm assuming you mean other businesses that I wouldn't be able to do what I do without. Um, Correct. Yes. <clears throat> well, so I essentially have two businesses. We have Eddie Farm, which grows flowers and vegetables. And then we also have Connecticut Flower Collective. Um, those two businesses work hand in hand. Um, and so definitely wouldn't have the type of outlet that I do for my cut flowers if the collective didn't exist. Um, so that's certainly one of them. And then I would also say there are several other large wholesalers that we sell to. One of them is the Floral Reserve in Providence um, who are great resources uh, for floral designers from a wider range. For example, they ship flowers and we sell flowers to some of those folks as well. Um, if we can get a good enough price for wholesale, then we will sell to some other wholesalers as well. Great, awesome. So Christine, can you also answer that about auxiliary businesses that um, your business needs to continue to thrive? Yeah, um, so piggybacking off of Haley, uh, the collective is a huge part of our business as well. Um, so that is definitely necessary for us to thrive um, and going even further and that, um, the wedding business as a whole, um, I think a lot of our florists and designers uh, purchase a lot of collective material for their weddings. And um, as we saw in 2020, sales were a bit lower because there weren't as many weddings happening. Um, so that's definitely necessary for us to thrive. Um, also, my local small businesses that I sell um, to for resale. Um, I sell to a couple of grocers and a plant shop and a butcher. Um, these are all locally owned small businesses in New Haven that um, trusted me and took me on as one of their vendors. Um, so that is huge for me as well. Um, yeah, those are the two main, main businesses for me, I would say. Perfect. And how about for you, Robert? Okay, so my answer is gonna be a little weird. Um, so, uh, as you'd expect, um, I, for me, for me, um, all of you guys who are farming are an important part of, um, what helps me to be successful. And I want to, um, just highlight some of these other auxiliary businesses that we probably all depend on, like the one company that will, that is authorized to repair and maintain my tractor, um, the one company that's near me that supplies um, organic approved compost, um, the folks who do my taxes, the folks that do pay that do payroll. There are just not a lot of these other companies that do all of these things that our businesses depend on that have um, any expertise in, in farming. And it's because they're just not enough farmers to keep some of these companies in business. So, um, so I wanna give a plug out to um, all of you who are on the call, who are um, also flower farmers or thinking about um, becoming flower farmers. If you're thinking about it, um, feel free to jump in. The water's not bad, um, but we definitely need uh, a community of all of us um, to help support some of these other auxiliary businesses um, that we depend on just to to keep up, keep the lights on. Um, as a farmer, I I don't want I don't want to, and I can't do everything, and so I really rely on on other businesses to to do these other things. So that's my answer. Great. Well, that makes certainly a ton of sense, um, and we appreciate that. Um, Kristen, for you, any businesses that you see are so critical to yours thriving? 
yes. Um, I don't have a greenhouse. And again, with my vertical learning curve in terms of starting my own plants, I very early on um, partnered with a local greenhouse, Tri-County Greenhouse uh, in stores. And we, he, I go and I seed all my stuff. And then he and his staff, Chris, uh, the marvelous manager there, um, they grow on my plants. Um, it's a retail shop. So everything gets bumped up into six packs. So when I go pick them up, uh, there are these just beautiful, beautiful uh, plants that are ready to go right in the field. And that's been a really successful model for me um, to partner with the greenhouse. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, I believe uh, Becca has a question from the chat that she's going to um, feed to you guys. Yeah. So um, there's a couple questions coming in, but let's start off with the first one is uh, I'm actually going to combine two questions into one. So we had folks wondering what's some flower or filler that you grow every year. It's like these are these are your steadfast besides your normal dahlias and zinnias and things like that. Um, and someone also asked the top five, five flowers that you must grow. So for these beginning flower farmers, like what is important for them to have in their fields to make sure that they have enough diversity and enough reliability as well? Well, I'm happy to jump in and start with that, Nancy, if that works. Um, Absolutely. Go ahead, Haley. I think uh, there are a couple different ways to answer that question because, of course, it depends on what your outlet is. <laughs> but um, the simple question to answer first, at least for me, some of my very favorite crops that maybe get overlooked by people um, but are truly necessary for success and are something that sell really well for me and considering I'm doing almost strictly wholesale, uh, but I like to grow a wide variety of stuff. Um, Celosia is one of them, in particular, Flamingo Feather Celosia, which is the spike pink one, um, and Terracotta, which is a Celosia spicata that um, is kind of a dusty orange color. Those ones are really um, in high demand from floral designers, generally speaking, um, and also just kind of special and stand out in bouquets. Um, I also grow a ton of straw flower, um, a ton of gumfrina. Gumfrina is great because it fills a lot of space uh, in a bouquet, but does not take up a lot of space in your field. I.e., You can grow a ton of it in just one little spot. Um, and fillers are incredibly important. Um, I see this with my work as the collective, um, as one of the leaders of the collective, but also on my own farm, you cannot have enough foliage. So anything like dusty miller, eucalyptus, um, scented geranium that you can grow, you'll never be upset to have it. And I would also add to that list perennials like forsythia and spirea, nine bark, um, those are all items that you would never want to uh, skip in your planning because um, you always need some kind of greenery in your bouquet. Um, and those are things that will be beautiful from April through November um, and not something that you have to work too hard on. And then the other part of the question, um, I think, can, can you reiterate the second part of the question? <laughs> All right, um, I think, no, I think that that was, the, it was the, the top flowers for you, um, for reliability, for in regards to um, market, like what you're seeing from designers that they always want. And you saying, you know, those fillers and those uh, flowers that have longevity are super important. Um, so yeah. yeah, anything that you can, um, be harvesting throughout your entire season is really valuable because building a confidence from your buyer, especially a wholesale buyer who's looking to plan pretty far ahead for their designs is, um, going to be really, really valuable. Not only that, um, 
I would say if you do have high tunnels, Lysianthus is a great crop to grow because it's one of the crops that lasts the longest um, once it's blooming in the summertime. Um, so it's a short harvest window, but the vase life is very good and the uh, variety of colors is really excellent. Um, but again, we kind of specialize in certain things because of the way that we sell things and the way that we, um, you know, that we're set up to grow. We're going to have six high tunnels this year. So it's very, very different probably from what you, what Christina has in, at her farm and what Kristen has at her farm and what Robert has at his farm. So um, certainly investing the time in determining your markets before you invest your money in your lysianthus plugs or your ranunculus corms or your high tunnel is very, very important. Sure, that makes a lot of sense, Haley. Um, Christina, do you have um, something to share on that question? Yeah, um, I think what Haley said, a lot of the things it really depends on um, your market. Um, so I sell both retail, have retail customers in mind, and I also sell to the collective, which is more uh, event-based in mind. So um, I know this is controversial, but tulips are a big part of my um, farm plan. Um, it is a market leader and I do find it profitable the way I sell them. Um, but mostly it gets me started um, early in the season so that people get used to buying flowers from me. Um, and those have been really popular with my retail customers. And also we basically sell out of tulips every year at the collective. So there's always room for more. Um, I also do a lot of hardy annuals, which include a lot of those fillers that people are looking for in June for weddings. Um, I grow a lot of campanula, foxglove, spiky things, um, gypsophilia, greenery like blue pleurum, all these things overwinter really well for me. Um, and so they're very easy to grow without any structures. Um, you can kind of overwinter them without any cover at all in my region in Southern Connecticut. Um, and then in the fall, um, dahlias are obviously a big part of all of our farms, um, but also Celosia. Um, I like growing the coxcomb type, the big brainy guys. Um, they fill market bouquets really well, but they're also interesting enough and come in some really nice colors for events. Um, and yeah, I love growing amaranth and marigolds and um, there's just so many. <laughs> It's really hard to pick a top five. Yeah. <laughs> now, Robert, I know that in your intro, you did hit some of probably what were your top five, but hey, um, Becca, do you wanna reiterate the, there was a two part question there. So kind of feed that to Robert for going into. Sure, sure. So I guess the, the top flowers that you grow every year for flower and filler and you know, why you choose them. Are, is it because of reliability? Is it for your market? Um, is it because of your specific growing type? Um, why are those flowers so important? Yeah, um, so, so for me, a lot of the decisions made about what I grow are based on all the things that constrain how I grow. Um, so we're relatively, new farm here, our infrastructure is terrible to non-existent. So I, I'm growing things that, you know, for instance, I don't have a, a, a walk-in cooler yet. So I'm growing things like sunflowers and zinnias that don't have to be kept in a walk-in cooler. Um, things that I can harvest really quickly and, and bring to the market. So, so again, I'm, I'm, and, and also um, I should say, I'm terrible at arranging. So, um, so I don't even try to, to make um, beautiful flower arrangements like what you guys um, do. I basically um, grow things that I can just shove into a bucket and bring to a market and people are willing to, to buy by the stem or the bunch. Um, so I think it's, I think for, for new growers, for, for all of us, I think we have to kind of evaluate what are your strengths and weaknesses, you know what your limitations are. Um, and I guess the good thing about um, cut flower farming is 
even with all the limitations that you have, there are still plenty of flowers for you to choose from. Um, and I would say my top five are, uh, again, dahlias, um, sunflowers, zinnias, used to be gladiolus, but not anymore. Um, and, and now uh, probably will be celosias. Um, and, I'm, and again, like Kristen, since I am not a young person um, and, and looking at um, uh, saving my body, um, I'm looking also into doing um, a lot more perennial flowers so I can get off of the seed starting, seedling, carrying treadmill in the spring. Mm -hmm. Great. All righty. And uh, Kristen, for you, do you have a top five? Um, I, yeah, I say my top, my top flower is the Cafe Au Lait Dahlia. Um, for some reason, she and I just really, we're, we're <laughs> one. Um, but my, you know, dahlias are tricky. It depends on the year. Last year, they bloomed so late. And it was because of all that rain we had. When, when, they, when dahlias get too much rain, they just kind of stop growing. Um, so, you know, the, there's a question in the chat, just like, when do dahlias, they seem to bloom so late? Sometimes they, I've had them as early as July. Um, I do overwinter a, a row of cafe dahlias in my hoop house. And those usually they, I get those blooming by the end of June. So if you do have access to inside um, tunnel space, you can get, you can force dahlias. I leave them in all winter and up they come. And, um, and so that's really great. Um, and then just another thing for me in terms of varieties, I'm an emotional person and I make, you know, sometimes it, it, obviously it's not the best way to run a business, but I, love all flowers and so I did grow what I love and you know that kind of mojo just it it goes a long way when you're dealing with flowers um so you know so if you have favorites that you know we haven't mentioned as being you know top sellers just grow the grow a little bit of them anyway um I sort of coined this term boutique flower farm because you know just you know you just want to have flowers um but, and, you know, and the other investments are like mock orange is a great shrub, um, beautiful June flower, um, and zinnias, obviously, um, you know, and then the more you grow, you hone in on just colors that you really love or that sell really well, like white. And right now the queen series of zinnias is very popular. Um, someone mentioned brown flowers, you know, Lysianthus has some great brown shades, as does um, Celosia. Um, you know, so when you dig in more, you just kind of get, you know, you kind of follow your funky or your, you know, super pretty. Uh, Cosmos are another one of my huge mm -hmm. sellers, um, seeking out different varieties. Um, and then, you know, another word of caution is like, there's always going to be some funky new uh, hybrid. People are experimenting all the time with genetics and whatnot. I find sticking to heirloom, sticking to those, you know, those classic flowers, um, they're always the prettiest. They always hold their uh, parent plant the longest. Um, for example, with peonies, you know, your old fashioned fragrant peonies. I mean, come on, you can't, you can't beat that. You just gotta grow those. <laughs> Great. Well, I really appreciate that. Um, we're gonna get into another question and pose it to the, the entire panel there. Um, and we'll start with Haley. So um, how do you think differently and what does it mean um, to be an entrepreneur for you? Like in terms well, of- I, I didn't come into this initially thinking like, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm gonna start a farm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, my background is in uh, art and I started farming when I was around 25. So I didn't actually have all that many other jobs before I became a farmer. And now I've been doing that for 11 years. So um, there's a lot to be said for age and experience and wisdom. And to me, understanding the lessons that I've been taught by other people, by my own experiences, and by time is the definition of my entrepreneurship. And perhaps being able to look around me and be a swift decision maker, but to also be able to gather all of my experiences together and um, and synthesize that into 
uh, a way of living in a way of running my business that makes sense is, um, is really what it means to me to be an entrepreneur and maybe uh, defines my experience doing this more than other people. I've also found that there's a lot about owning a farm that's, um, that is different than I expected. And that it turns out I have some natural skill for, uh, that's bookkeeping and staff management and stuff like that, that, uh, I have learned a lot, you know, again, over the years, but really it's, taking advice and trying to put it into action. That's worked the best for me. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Christina, how about for you? Um, so my background, um, I studied plant science and ecology um, in college and then worked on several vegetable farms um, and thought I would always be a vegetable farmer um, until I worked with this florist in Philly. I was uh, the assistant of Nicole Rossi from Texture Florals, who is amazing. Everyone should check her out. She's very talented. Um, and she used a lot of local uh, flowers from surrounding Pennsylvania area. And it kind of showed me that um, I could merge my love of growing things with um, my creativity um, and that has kind of shaped how I flower farm I guess um, but yeah I've always been a big planner and dreamer um, I basically planned out this farm for years before we even started looking for property um, and yeah I'm just kind of learning as we go how to be um, you know, an entrepreneur, I guess, um, and managing my own business for the first time. Um, but yeah, it's definitely learning something new all the time and learning from others. Mm -hmm. Great. And Robert, how about for you? Um, being an entrepreneur, I mean, for some people's journey, obviously it's an evolution and it isn't necessarily something that they charted out you know, like Kristen did long-term way ahead, you know, some of us evolve, but for you, Robert, how about, what do you think? For me, it was definitely chaotic um, and not anything like Kristen. I definitely should have taken this workshop with Kristen five years ago um, so that I would, I would have done better and made a lot fewer mistakes. Um, that said, I'm still going to be making lots of beginner mistakes this coming season and next year. That's just um, part of, part of the journey. Um, I, I, never got any formal training. I didn't apprentice or, or intern at a farm. Um, again, I've, I've worked, um, I've had a full-time non-ag related job um, the whole time and uh, as part of my farming career to, to pay the bills. So um, so I've, I've attended workshops like this um, and just tried to network and speak with other farmers and, and do what I can um, in the off season to, to um, learn what I can. And, and again, my my approach to flowers has really been sort of a slow creep. Um, so I started out again, mostly with vegetables and, and um, you know, started with just some sunflowers. Um, and then from there kind of like gradually expanded to, you know, other, other things. So, um, so I'm definitely self-taught um, and I've just um, sort of given myself the, the time and space to sort of learn and not freak out when things don't go as planned. Um, and I, I try to every year grow something new and different that I'm not, um, not accustomed to. Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, in the world of flowers, there's so many things that you can grow that um, it, it's okay to, to, um, to learn that you're, you're not good at growing everything. Like mm -hmm. Blue Clarum and Bells of Ireland last year um, uh, really made me question my life choices, but um, so I will not grow them from seed again. But, um, but more power to those of you who do. <laughs> I'll buy your seedlings. <laughs> and I, I think as you guys have mentioned, like nobody knows everything. So you can, you know, take classes. It, it's not a failure if you learn from something. It's just part of the journey. So you can, you know, if there's something specific that you need to 
know more about, you can borrow a degree or, you know, like ask someone and utilize what information that you can extract from them to get you by. But I mean, that's, that's all good. And there's no, no failures in my book. You just have to utilize what information that is. Like I shouldn't grow that again or, you know, move on and, and keep growing it. Um, Becca, do you have a question um, from, oh, Kristen, Kristen, I'm sorry, you're, you're up next. I'm up um, about the entrepreneurial. Yeah. What does well, it, not, how do you, how do you think plans? differently and what does it mean to you to be an entrepreneur? Um, well, just because I had my plan doesn't mean there is no such thing as a perfect farmer. I mean, so many mistakes, so many, you know, trials and errors. Um, for me, just the entrepreneurship is, um, oh gosh, just, you know, just trying to figure it out, you know, just taking this passion of just like, I mean, I love flowers. I'm a, um, my name is Kristen. I'm a bulbaholic, right? It's like, <laughs> I, tulips make me insane, like all spring flowers. And, um, and so just taking that and just like, how can I do this? I would stalk a woman at um, the farmer's market in Chicago. And I'm like, I want to do this. And she'd be like, you're crazy. Do something else, you know? And, um, and so it's just, you know, you just have to start. That's, that's my, you know, my advice, just start, put stuff in the ground, figure out what you're good at, what you love, well, you know, just what makes you, uh, you know, I still get teary eyed when I harvest ranunculus. It's just like, I can't believe these are so amazing. Right. Um, so it's just, you know, keeping in tune with that passion. <laughs> they probably didn't answer the question at all. But <laughs> No, you did. You did. And I think that that's important is to like, those are the things that you were passionate about. So that was like what you wanted to figure out because you already had like that passion for those certain flowers or flowers in general. And the rest, yes, we a little bit throw caution to the wind, but there's something about each of you that made you like jump and do it and figure the rest of it out. I mean, obviously there's bookkeeping, there's record keeping, there's a lot of the things that come into it that will elevate your business to be successful. But without that passion, then it's, you know, for, it seems like you're not going to be set, setting yourself apart from any of the other businesses unless you have like a, that certain um, nugget inside you. So... Um, Becca, just checking in, do you have something for the panel? Yeah, so I think one of the questions that came up a couple times was pricing, which especially is important for new businesses. Um, you know, I'm sure plenty of you have experienced kind of cutting your yourself short and not charging enough for your flowers and learning after the fact. So how did you all kind of come to um, pricing your flowers out to make sure that you brought in a profit and that you were paying yourself for your work? So pricing is always one of those things that makes everybody feel really uncomfortable. And of course it's what everybody really, really wants to know. And I think that having a few good friends who are also flower farmers really helps <laughs> with your pricing. Um, I think maybe Kristen from Muddy Feet was one of the first people I met in Connecticut doing cut flower farming probably about 10 years ago when we both started. Um, I think you might be a year ahead of me though, Kristen. And, um, you know, it, it, you just, you just kind of have to ask the questions. And what I always wanted from any person I asked was like, just a price list. But unfortunately, prices change all the time. <laughs> they change every day. They've changed a ton since when I first started. Um, pricing is so different for each and every single thing that you might do. So if I'm selling a bunch of flowers, 10 stems wholesale, I might be looking at a couple of different sources to figure out what that price could be. I'm looking at other wholesalers. So maybe I get their I sign up to receive their price list um, wholesale. Sometimes I call them and say, what are you selling Scaviosa for today? Um, sometimes I call um, Anna Jane from Little State Flower Company and say, what are you selling such and such for wholesale? The other 
things that we're selling thing, you know, we're selling items for would be retail price. Obviously your retail price per stem is going to be higher than your wholesale price per stem. Um, however, sometimes your wholesale price per stem can be extremely high. For, for example, last year, Holland was selling peonies just before peony season here. Uh, designers could get them for like $6 and 50 cents a step from Holland, which like I would never pay, but they were paying it. And so we were like, Oh, I guess we should raise our peony price. Um, but it all has to do with supply and demand. It's a, it's unfortunately a moving target. Um, but I think you can sort of set some baselines for yourself that are pretty simple. Um, if you figure out your wholesale price per stem uh, for a certain items, so let's say you have a, a farmer's market bouquet that you're trying to price and you figure out what your wholesale price per stem is for that, you um, find out what that total is and then double it. <laughs> or if you think the market can bear it, find out what your wholesale price per stem is and triple it. Um, your labor is worth a lot and you have to um, make sure that you're covering all of your costs and all of everybody's prices should be going up this year because prices are going up for every single one of our um, materials that we're using. Gas and diesel is more expensive. Um, paper flower sleeves are more expensive. You know, shipping is more expensive for everything that we get shipped to our farms. Uh, farming is very expensive. You should be making money if you're working this hard. So, um, you know, take the time to do the math. And don't be afraid of people saying your stuff is too expensive. Um, they will say that. And you can look them in the eye and say, I know that my time is worth it. So you don't need to buy this, but please don't say it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I totally get that. How about for you, Christina? Yeah, yes to everything Haley just said. Um, at the collective, we do have a standardized price sheet, which helps get our baseline wholesale numbers. And then you can kind of go from there. But I think it's really important to keep records every year of each of your major crops, um, uh, how much you harvested, if you can figure out, you know, the labor it took or for each crop. And that's pretty difficult to do, but if you have some major crops, um, you can kind of figure it out. Um, and then what your sales were and make sure you're making enough money to grow that um, and adjust prices if you have to uh, every year, because like Haley said, everything is getting more expensive for us. So um, it kind of needs to be reevaluated every year mm -hmm. as you go. Certainly. Um, and Robert, how about for you? Um, so I'll, again, just echo what the experts Haley and, and Christina have said. Um, I'll add that what I've seen at the farmers market is um, you'll uh, you'll get more people complaining about the price of vegetables than you will people complaining about flowers. Um, what I found is that the people who are going to buy uh, a nice or a whole bunch of, of really pretty flowers um, are probably willing to spend. 50% um, or more than what I'm charging. <laughs> so, so I, I feel like, I, I feel like, um, you know, Haley's right. We, we, as flower growers, um, I, I think we, we have the ability to, to um, ask for a fair price for, for the flowers. I think in the consumer's mind, um, you know, local flowers, especially if they look, they look pretty They're, you know, people are, are willing to, to spend a little more than they are for a head of lettuce. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Okay. And how about for you, Kristen? Um, well, you know, all of the above, but a couple other things to add is um, you can sign up for um, price weekly price lists from some of the big wholesalers. Um, so I get the one from the Boston flower market and uh, East coast, uh, which is down in Norwalk. And, you know, you get there and you just check out what their price, what their selling for, you know, and then, um, you know, I'm a firm believer that local flowers are, you know, more beautiful and they last longer. And so you can kind of adjust your prices accordingly, but it also gives you a great uh, bottom line of like, oh, they're, you know, they're charging this. Maybe I want to bring my prices down a little bit or up 
um, especially mm -hmm. up because I mean, last year wholesale prices were crazy high. Um, and so it's like, well, like Kaylee mentioned with peonies, it's like, well, we need to be making more on our peonies because they're far superior. Um, so there's that. And then another thing I wanted to say is quality is really important when it comes, when you start to sell your flowers to the public, um, because in order to get those high prices, you really do need to have good quality, long lasting flowers that, um, that are worth the, the extra money that people will spend on it. And my example I always use is every year at my farmer's market, um, there's another vegetable farmer that grows flowers. And when she comes in with her flowers, all of my customers go buy hers because they are really, really, really underpriced. Um, and then, uh, you know, every year my sales go way down that week. And then the next week they come back because um, they, you know, they don't, they don't last as long. Uh, and, so, and so that's just always my lesson of just like, just keep cranking them out, keep good quality, take condition, do all those things that you need to do as a flower farmer that's different from, say, you know, harvesting vegetables. Um, and the customers will continue to, to buy from you. Um, so those are my, that's my two cents there. Yeah, I think I also saw, if I could jump in again, um, I think I saw in the chat that someone was asking at the collective if there's pricing recommendations. Um, Yes, that's something that has been in high demand from all the growers. So we actually have a pricing suggestion sheet and uh, you have three choices for your price for your product. So there's a standard price and then the standard is described. This is like a whole document that we've put together for every single item that might get sold at the collective. There's a standard price, there's a short price. So that's for um, a bunch that is not standard, but is still beautiful. It might be a shorter stem, for example. And then there's a premium price, like this is way better than standard, so I'm charging way more. Um, and uh, so people have a choice of what to charge based on their determination of uh, the closeness of their product for sale for the standard, but um, that is that guidance is given to collective members. Um, I would also note that those typically our prices are a bit higher than uh, surrounding wholesalers because uh, our quality is better. So um, designers who are buying from the collective have less shrinkage, they have less loss of um, loss of money through flowers dying. For example, um, they might buy a bunch from a wholesaler and the whole bunch might go bad before their event. Uh, it's really unlikely that that happens through the collective. So um, that's, that's uh, some more resources that are out there. Well, unfortunately the time is going by so very quickly with our question and answers. So um, we're gonna do another question um, from our list and then Becca, maybe we'll see what, what time frame it is. We may, um, we would just want to be conscientious of the time for those people who are joining us like on a lunch hour or a, or a tight window. Um, and then, um, we can try to answer some of the questions in the chat. If they went unanswered, we'll try to get those folks some answers. Um, so I would like, you know, just kind of knowing that the audience is um, possibly just wanting to start into flowers or newer into the flower business and then just with the expertise that we have on the panel, ask this question about what steps would you encourage your fellow farmers to take um, in developing their own um, farm business? to be like more unique or set themselves apart from, you know, another business, another farming business. Haley, do you want to go first? Yeah, can you can you say the question again though? I was looking in the chat. Sure. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, no, it's hard to keep track of all that. Could you name like one step that you would encourage a, 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 fe a fellow farmer who was interested in either taking on a flower business or another business, um, just like as a little nugget, like one certain thing that you would encourage them oh, to do to yeah. launch. So community over competition would be the title to this answer. And that is get to know all of the other people who do the same thing. You'll find that rather than trying to beat you down, they really want to lift you up. And mm -hmm. when everybody communicates about the things that they like or don't like about the industry, 
you can more specifically direct your energy towards something that you feel you're uniquely qualified to do more or better than other people because we all have a different piece of land. We all have different amounts of funding. We all have different experiences in our past and we all have different ways we wanna spend our day. Um, and so I think it just demystifies the entire um, feeling of competitiveness between farmers who have no business competing with each other. Like Robert said, there aren't nearly enough of us. So we should all <laughs> be doing great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, Christina, do you have any uh, thoughts to add to what Haley was saying? Um, um, like one piece, one little nugget you could give to a, a launch. Yeah. Just jump in. I mean, try everything, experiment. Um, that's the only way you'll find out what works for your business and your farm. Cool. How about you, for you, Robert? Um, yeah, I guess I'd echo what Haley and, and um, Kristen said, and, and also something that what, um, sorry, what Christina said just now, and also what um, Kristen said earlier, which is, um, you know, um, start growing things that you like, that you feel passionate about. Um, again, there's, Connecticut has lots of consumers, not as many farmers. We don't really have to worry about competition. Um, we're all trying to help each other succeed here. Um, so, um, so really, I, I think for any new grower, you have the luxury of, of chasing after your passion and, and there's definitely a way to make that work. Um, I'm here in Connecticut and, and you've got allies who want to see you succeed. So, um, uh, as, as Christina said before, come on in. Yeah. Come join nice. us. Yeah. Kristen? Yeah, I would just add that, uh, you know, do your research, like go to different farmers markets, go, you know, travel around, you know, reach out to farmers, just kind of, um, you know, see if you can go visit a, an operation, you'll learn so much by seeing, you know, us in, um, in action, you know, take advantage of these programs, obviously, like you're doing. Um, but just see, you know, see what's out there. Like farmers markets is a great place to just kind of see like, what are local farmers growing? And where can I fit in? that may, you know, um, and, and then just, you know, again, just start, I mean, just, just get mm -hmm. your hands dirty, just grow flowers and then see where that, where that takes you. Um, there's just so many different, um, places where you can, can sell them or give them away or donate them and just lots and lots and lots of different avenues. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, if I could just add um, really one thing really quickly. I mean, I, I started out just by, I started out um, just growing some, you know, double sunflowers. Um, so, you know, you can start out really small and, and make a good, um, you know, impression on, on your market and your customers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to, you don't have to grow everything um, mm -hmm. all at once. You can, you can literally start with just like a couple of things um, and grow from there. Right. And if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> That's not true. But I, I, I'm with you, Robert. I think a lot of people, I mean, as much as some of the advice is to just jump right in and some people like to just put, you know, 100 different kinds of seeds. I think it's good advice to start and do, do something really well and turn that into the world. And then you can always add to it by variety or size. And, and then like Kristen said, when your quality is up there, there's no denying, you know, you should be able to within reason, like set your price because you are setting yourself, you know, up in a different way that it's like apples and oranges. And so you can say, this is, this is why my product is at this price. Um, we are getting very close to noon, so I'm going to do, do my, my closing thank you, and I'm hoping that the panel can stay on for maybe one more question, um, just to get the route, but if in, in case anyone needs to bow out. Um, firstly, again, Becca, you've been amazing. I can never keep track of all of this stuff in the chat or the IT stuff, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, I just want to, um, I know that she 
very recently in one of the chat spaces put the evaluation so please log on to that i can't tell you how much we appreciate when those that feedback comes to us and our funders are super happy when we're able to share that back but we really do listen to what you need for programming and trainings um what else yeah, the last question that I want to um, pose to the group is basically if you could say like one, one thing that helps you in your method of decision making, what would you share it for like, you know, keeping in mind that you are setting new growers up for this? What's the one thing that you watch out for in decision making? One thing I watch out for, like a bad thing. Or well, like take into consideration to make, you know, oh. what you should do for the next year or what you should grow, like. Um, getting advice. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. One thing. <laughs> um, I mean, me, okay. a tiny bit if you'd like. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, well, getting advice from many different sources, so. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I don't make any decisions until I've talked to my dad, for example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I often talk to at least three or four um, other flower farmers that I know about various things. Um, mm -hmm. And then also I uh, kind of like take a deep breath and like to jump in and do like big things. So um, I would say, don't be afraid of doing that, if that's the way you operate, you can do that successfully um, mm -hmm. and go for it. Awesome. Okay, Christina? Um, for me, looking at the next season and say what I'm gonna grow or what I'm gonna grow less of, um, I look a lot at market demand of the previous seasons um, and maybe any uh, anything upcoming that I need to plan for. Um, and then also looking at financial records. Um, so what was profitable for me last year and what wasn't and uh, make decisions on crops that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really helpful. How about for you, Robert? Um, so it definitely helps to keep um, good records and notes of things as you go along, which I am absolutely terrible at. Um, so, um, so I want to encourage people to to not do what I do and and to to be better at it. Um, and then another the thing I would say is just to to be patient with yourself. Things take time, um, and um, and nature wants to succeed as much as you do. So don't be discouraged. Awesome. And Kristen, how about for you? Oh gosh, I most of my decision. I this is so bad, but it's. I just go with my gut, you yeah. know, again, mm -hmm. it's just like, I should look at my numbers and it, but I'm like, oh, I know cotton doesn't make any money, but I love cotton. So I have to, so I grow my stupid cotton every year, you know, um, not the best business thing, but usually my, you know, when I have, I do my quiet time, I, I'm pretty intuitive and know wh which direction I want to go in and it's worked mm -hmm. out well so far. So that's, <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. All right. So at this point, again, I just want to thank everybody for being here who attended the panelists for sharing their wealth of knowledge. I think it was really valuable for us to hear from such an amazing panel. Um, Becca, any final thoughts before we sign off for the day? No. No. Great. Sorry, we have didn't get to all the questions, everyone, but yeah.